Okay, welcome everyone. I'm Brenda Minuti. I'm the VP of Operations here at Raven, and I'll be your host today. A little bit about me, passionate about continuous improvement and driving our way through people, purpose, and tools. Thanks for joining our webinar panel on how Portland Forge modernized their factories using the power of people and technology. I'm really excited about today's session. It's been a highlight for me since before the holidays when the team kind of put this together. I will introduce you to our panelists in just one moment, but before we get started, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items for you. This webinar will be recorded and a copy of the recording will be sent to you via email later on today. Marisha from our marketing team is online for technical support. So if you have any questions or issues throughout the session, please feel free to use the chat option to message her and she can help you out. And lastly, we'd love for you to join in the conversation today. If you have questions, please do submit them in the Q&A box. You can access the Q&A box in the menu bar at the bottom of the screen. We've set aside time for the Q&A at the end of the webinar to be able to go through all the questions. So a little bit about what Raven does. For those of you that are not familiar with Raven, we work with manufacturers in two key ways. We help them account for 100% of production time and losses, and we engage operators and make it easy for them to provide meaningful human context that enables confident, fact-driven productivity improvements on the shelf floor. I'll hand it over to Paul and Bob to do their quick intros. Over to you, Paul. Thanks, Brenda. So, hi, I'm Paul Turner, President and Chief Operating Officer at Raven. I joined Raven um, almost a year ago now. I was previously a customer. I um, was so delighted with uh, working with Raven that I joined the company. Uh, and I sort of have a background in, in sort of manufacturing, particularly around uh, production optimization for about the past, it says 25 years on the screen. I'll stick with that. <laughs> Over to you, Bob. Bob, did you want to do a control? Hi, I'm Bob. Uh, Bob Zeeb. I've been a manufacturer for the past 38 years. Time flies. Um, and, you know, in various instances, starting in automotive and then getting involved in turnarounds over the past decade plus. Uh, you know, um, looking forward to sharing some of our experience with Raven and exactly what it's been able to provide us uh, to move the business forward. Fantastic. I think that's what I've been super excited about the conversation of just hearing both your perspectives with so much experience within the industry. So a quick recap on our agenda for this afternoon. We're going to start off with a journey to the factory of the future. Then we'll jump into our next theme, which is ways to leverage the power of people for increased efficiency, engagement, and work-life balance. We'll hand it over to Bob to kind of discuss around Portland Forge results and key wins. And our last theme of the day will be advice on how to execute a digital transformation strategy across multiple plans. This will then be followed by the Q&A. So as we're going through the discussion, please do use that chat box as well to input your questions. Bob, can you give us a quick overview of Black Portland Force for our audience today? Thanks for blessed your audio there, Bob. I bet, sorry. There we um, go. <laughs> Portland Forge is an age old industry. Uh, we take steel bar, we cut it into uh, billets. Uh, we heat up those billets, whether induction or through gas fired furnaces, and then we use presses or hammers uh, to forge the parts. Uh, the facility in Portland, Indiana is well over 100 years old, while the facility in uh, Lebanon, Kentucky, is just over 30 years old. Uh, the businesses are, are very strong businesses. Uh, there's, there's a platform for product and sales to, to really expand. However, uh, the facilities don't necessarily have the, the latest technologies. And understanding what we need to do to, to support our workforce out there to really, what can we do successfully and have an environment where we can work safe, we can produce quality product at rates, and then you know, create a culture where people want to come to work. Nothing's worse than coming to work uh, when equipment doesn't run or you can't do your job with um, really a high level of success and, and understanding what downtime is and what's our slow points. By nature of our business, there's a lot of time in which we're waiting for material to heat up in gas-fired furnaces. Uh, we had an initiative to reduce the heat up time and ultimately what we wanted to do with our people is to reduce the amount of overtime and 
then uh, allow them to make more money. Our folks wanted to make more money and they didn't want to work a continuing 10 hour day, six days a week, on and on and on for years. Uh, and they wanted us to fix uh, some of their, their woes. Uh, so, you know, the Raven technology as we move forward with installing some things that were very simple, and we'll get into this as we go, uh, allowed us to do just that. Uh, fulfill our customer orders quicker uh, and provide a better platform for our employees in which working safely and quality and going home and having a better standard of life while making work, making more money, allowed them that platform. Yeah, that's a fantastic intro, Bob. And I think you've opened up our next theme, which is the journey to the factory of the future. So we're going to kick off a, a bit of a poll just to drive some engagement for the audience here. So three, uh, four questions there for answers. Does your organization have a digital transformation strategy? And the choices are no, we haven't discussed the digital transformation strategy yet. Yes, we have a digital transformation strategy in place. We've identified the need for a strategy to adopt new technologies, or we're unsure. So we'll give their attendees a bit of time to pick their choices there. Not to influence the poll results, Paul and Bob, but I was reading a quick article about 2023 manufacturing outlook analysis um, done by Deloitte, and they listed the number one trend in manufacturing to look out for is investing in advanced technologies to help mitigate risk. What are your thoughts around what the audience is gonna give us here in terms of an answer? I, I go with a stat that it, it'll, be, it'll be spread out because I, I think even within a single organization, um, you know, multiple factories on an enterprise level. The different factories will be at different sort of stages of, of maturity. Uh, so even within the same company, you, you, you could have, you know, different answers ticked on this box. You know, technology is important and making it simple is even more important. Uh, what the Raven tool allowed is simplicity and speed. Uh, speed of installation and start to collect data and then speed to work on items that at times are, we like to call them JDIs, just do it. While at other times it's gonna need investment planning and organization. A lot of the just do's, um, the faster you can do it, the better you're gonna win the workforce over. And that'll allow your platform to be able to then, you know, gain revenue or profitability to make the, the smart investments down the road. Uh, yeah. So it's the speed is very, very important. And that's what Raven gave us. That's fantastic. Okay, the poll results are in. 58% of our audience say they have identified the need for a strategy to adopt new technologies. 25% are unsure. And we have a tired 8%. No, we haven't discussed your transformation yet. And yes, we have one. So I think everyone is still on the need of trying to identify what's the right strategy. Yeah, so that's a good question for the uh, the webinar to answer is, you know, how, how do we get started? What are those first steps? Exactly. <laughs> and I think it really kicks back, um, Paul, because early in my career, I think the factory of the future was a real thing as a project engineer starting off. And it was all about working on the digitization transformations. But a lot of what I saw from my simple mind was a lot of building the mega plants and shutting down the old facilities, right? So it's that notion that, Digitization is always kind of associated with brand new. And I think I'm really eager to kind of hear Bob's perspective as we go through uh, the, the, the seven of today as well. Paul, what has been the experience in your journey in the factory of the future so far with some of the organizations you've been with? Yeah, well, um, just, just from the outset, I, I, I think the whole idea of having lighthouse factories uh, with industry four, within manufacturing sites, that that's driven a, a lot of um, innovation and demonstrated the, the art of the possible over the past decade or even more. Um, however, um, not every factory is an appropriate candidate for everything that Industry 4 can, can throw at it. Um, many factories are still using pen and paper, Excel spreadsheets, whiteboards to facilitate, facilitate daily standard work, often very old equipment that you know doesn't necessarily uh, easily hook up to the latest digital technology. Um, and the cost of upgrading to a fully fledged factory of the future 
could be quite eye-watering for some factories, especially without having a clear uh, line of sight to the return on investment. So um, it doesn't have to be uh, an all or nothing approach though. Uh, you can you can sort of industry four can be a journey with with each step on that journey generating sufficient ROI uh, to fund sort of the next step. So instead of creating say from the outset multi million dollar cloud based architectures for analytics, um, you can start with some of the basics on the shop floor. Um, so for example, and I'll, I'll use a Raven example, uh, one of the fundamental building blocks of factory floor productivity improvements is to have a complete and accurate granular contextualized timeline for every critical asset. Uh, and generating that can be as simple as just installing a simple photo eye sensor to measure part count and then having a simple operator interface for, for entering downtimes. Um, and generating that sort of information uh, can be a fuel for operational excellence and productive continuous improvement programs. So that first step as came out of the poll uh, for, for digitalization doesn't have to be expensive. Uh, it can be quite quick to implement to get that first rung on the ladder, regardless of the age of the plan, as, as we'll see later on. Uh, and then I think not only are you getting an ROI then to feed sort of um, your journey up the maturity curve, but you get that that bottom up approach gets that uh, important buy in from frontline workers, which lays a solid foundation for sort of future strategic digital transformation initiatives. So Bob, um, can you tell us about how um, your experience was at Portland Forge? Well, you know, Paul, I grew up in um, the automotive industry, which was always on the cutting edge. I can see every point within the manufacturing process, whether it be a stamping plant or an assembly plant, and where our constraints were, as well as product flow, as well as downtime and real-time basis. Not only when I was sitting in my office or on the shop floor, but from home. Uh, you know, after the Ford Motor Company, I got involved in turnarounds uh, with equity groups. And oftentimes those are smaller businesses that don't necessarily have that technology or the platform to be able to do that. Um, a lot of the ERP systems are homegrown, uh, but what Raven allows us to do is take a web-based platform. It's all web-based. It doesn't tie into anything, uh, but it gives you real relevant data that's really easy for the operator on the floor to, to interface with. There's no, you know, we don't have to fill out the downtime sheets anymore. It's a nothing more than a, a touch to a touch screen that says when it, when I'm running, it's green and we plan it to how long, you know, if it doesn't run for a period of time at the pay point, it goes red. If it goes red, the operator simply says, why is it red? Then it starts to collect the data. And when the line starts back up, it goes green. I don't have to do anything as an operator. I don't have to walk over to another computer and input my data. I don't have to write anything down. It's as, as simple as it gets. And it didn't take a bunch of infrastructure to put in place. It's all Wi-Fi and enhance our process with, within the shops to get data that helps us you know, ultimately get better. No, that does have both fantastic perspectives. And I think the theme that I'm hearing is keep it simple as that's the right requirements for your appropriate plans. And I think Paul and Bob, you nailed it, right? It's not always about the big, huge capital investment. It's about finding what's relevant and easy for the operators to use as well. And you know, Brenda, we'll, we'll see it a little bit later, but also what our guys have been able to do is in, inherent to our process, we have a heat. It's gonna, the metal has to heat up. It's an engineered time that if, you know, if, if the conditions are right, which means the furnace is right, the steel is right, things like that, it's gonna heat up to the, to the temperature that we need it to be in a certain time frame. Our guys, they, they understand that we calculated what that time frame is supposed to be. And they actually use the, the clock that's ticking down and saying how long it's been heating to then go back out there and be ready at the instant that the material is ready to run. And that allows them to, to then run the product. Uh, it, it, it's a cadence that we develop. It's it's almost like a dance. I run them, they're heating up. I, you know, I run them, we get it ready for the next heat. We may go grab a quick cup of coffee. So, and sometimes the, the heat up times might be 20 minutes. Sometimes they're six or seven minutes. 
but it gives them that impetus to not only the guys on the floor to get out there and do it, but also the supervisor to say, hey, come on, guys, let's go. And, yeah. and, and yeah, see it in real time. That's absolutely fantastic. And I think, Bob, just a quick question around that as well, because it's really about that journey of the factory as a teacher. I think in your intro, um, when you were kind of giving us a brief overview of Portland Ford, you mentioned it's an old plant, 30 plus years, right? In terms of that um, setup, what were your initial steps to really kind of say, okay, we're moving forward with the digitization? Because I think the big question that came from the poll is people are kind of unsure where to start, right? So maybe if you could just hit on that little nugget for the audience for me, please. Well, part of it, we took on a project to, for continuous improvement in two very large assets within the, the Portland facility and try to understand what is it that we need to do, you know, post COVID, uh, post a lot of things that went on in, in the world and get ourselves back up to uh, a cadence. Uh, prior to that, we had, you know, people that retired and lost tribal knowledge. Uh, there are a lot of things that changed as well as some major maintenance projects. So what do we got to do? What, what's stopping us from getting to where we need to be? And, you know, how do we put the initiative in place um, to understand what it is? We started the project, oh, let's fix this, let's fix that, but quickly realized that we didn't have all the right data and we couldn't really quantify with our current process how much that wait time was. And, you know, we're, we're lucky enough to have um, a group we we're working with that knew of Raven and pointed us in the direction of that. And it was literally within two weeks, we had two units that were installed in this critical path that allowed us to start to collect data and personalize um, the Raven tool to our business and what the information that we needed to, to start to gather to help us then put some real uh, instances in place. And to give you the effect, our percentage off standard improved by 10 points year over year after the installation. And after doing some major work associated with those constraints, that percent of standard continues to improve uh, with the folks. It's, it's a better day when they can come to work and just work. It's, it's a long day when I, I, I want to do my job, but man, I got to, so this is down, that's not working. I got to chase this down. That, that's a long day. Let me just come to work, do my job and go home. That's a great perspective. I think it ties back to Paul, right? Let's get the facts account for every second of that production timeline. Fantastic. We're going to kick off another poll here. So our next theme is ways to leverage the power of people for increased efficiency, engagement and work-life balance. So I'll, I'll ask Marisha to kick off the next poll for us. So it's what's the level of collaboration your teams, sorry, what's the level of collaboration your team has within your plants and across um, the company? Answers are none to minimal collaboration and communication, clear open communication channels and information sharing in our plants, processes for company resource sharing when needed, or cross-functional teams that regularly collaborate on project strategies across plants and across company as well. I'm all about trying not to influence the polls, but I, it's really difficult for me to kind of influence on this one. So Paul and Bob, I'm gonna hand over this to you guys just so I don't get myself in trouble, but what have you seen as a baseline in terms of engagement levels across the organizations you've worked for? Well, I, I mean, if, it'd be nice if everybody checked the second one, but my, my guess is that they, they, they won't. Um, you know, we, we see a lot of silos uh, in organizations, particularly large organizations. Uh, you know, IT uh, departments think one way, OT departments think another way, and then the frontline team sort of maybe think a, a different way. Um, I mean, IT and OT uh, can even say the same thing if we use a different language. You think of real time. Uh, in uh, the IT space, that's more of a transactional concept, but real time in an OT space is, is sort of can be milliseconds sort of uh, observation of, of what's going on, on on the plant. And so bringing those disparate teams together uh, and getting them to sort of work together in, in maybe sort of swap like teams, uh, I think is a challenge for, for all manufacturers. Some have managed to do it and it's been very successful. Um, but, you know, breaking down those, those, those silos can definitely be a challenge. You know, to your point, breaking down the silos, but we got to realize as leadership that we're no different than the guys down on the shop floor. 
we have, you know, without those guys on shop floor, they don't need us. And we got to realize that any manufacturing facility that may not be performing to where we want it to perform, the answers to why it's not performing are out there on the shop floor. And going out there and listening to the people, uh, you know, sadly, uh, and I, I shouldn't say sadly, remarkably, there are many instances where we did something to improve the process and the guys on the shop floor would come back and say, we told you. And, and they were right. They were right. You know, <laughs> as, you know, we are no different. We're no smarter. Uh, we're, no, we're no different. But together, man, we're powerful. And if we can bring in smart engineers or you know, smart, smart CI guys that have the ability to listen and to be able to help organize plan lead and organize so those guys down on the floor can execute, we'll be successful more times than not. And it's, it's that, that part of put 100 people in a room, 30 of them are leaders. we got to find them. Find those leaders that are out there and, and get them on board because the next 50 people are going to follow. They're the followers. And there's always a percent that we're never going to make happy. But I'll go, you know, we'll win a game with 80% of the people on board. We'll be successful. Yeah, fantastic. So I'll pull results in. 50% of the audience says they do have processes for company resource sharing when needed. 25% do have clear, open communication channels and information sharing in their plants. And 13% it's shared, none to minimal collaboration and communication. And cross functional teams that regularly collaborate on project strategy. It's a bit across the board. I think they, it's also interesting that these processes for company resource sharing, but does that fully equate to the collaboration and breaking the silos, right? That you both mentioned as well earlier. Yeah. And I think from a digitization perspective as well, it's interesting for me because I think Bob, you nailed it. Like all my projects throughout my entire career, right? The operator always knows what's needed, what we need to do. So it's really how do we empower them as we're doing that fact finding and putting their data gathering on um, together. Another aspect of it, which is also interesting, I've seen and worked with a group of people where, you know, recently mm -hmm. Forbes had an article on the rise of artificial intelligence, right? So the whole notion is, will robots replace people? So digitization is almost that concept where we may kind of fast forward to completely automate and digitize without really focusing on that people element and the soft skills, right? So I think here at Wave and our product team has really nailed that from my perspective, where we have a UX that has that human machine interaction that allows for that ease for the operator to be able to provide to that context. So I think no one wants added work. Bob, you nailed it for me, right? And I think that's just one piece of the puzzle to drive results. The critical part is really engaging those users. So Bob, how have you been able to leverage the power of people in your plants to enable your journey? Well, leveraging the power of people is, you know, you know, how do you build a team? How do you define the roles and responsibilities? And then how do we take care of the, I guess you'd call them excuses on why we can't as opposed to why we can't. Yeah, and don't necessarily look at value as a problem. That failure may, may have just been a bad plan. It's an opportunity to get better. And, and you know, use data along the way. You know, like we said, nobody comes to work to not do their job. It's a process that allows it to happen. And how do we improve the process to get more reliability? Yeah, fantastic. Paul, and what are your thoughts on the engagement piece and buy-in? Uh, well, you know, sort of voicing Raven again, of course, engaging frontline workers is, is key for any digital transformation in this initiative. Um, top down or top down driven uh, deployments that fail to engage the operations teams will ultimately fail themselves. Uh, and it's not easy. Operators are very busy. Uh, they expect software to make their lives easier and definitely not place an additional burden of tasks on them. So if you do want to engage operations teams successfully, then any solution, it has to be seen to be useful to, to the team, uh, particularly in their daily standard work. Um, at Raven, we, we approach this really with three from three angles. Firstly, if and we've already said this, if you do have to engage an operator and ask them for some sort of input, then you have to make it as easy as possible for them. Uh, these environments are often very greasy, oily, wearing gloves. You know, the last thing they want to be doing is typing in 
downtime reasons. So make that as easy as possible. Uh, secondly, is um, you know try and automate some of the downtime reasons if it makes sense. Uh, if there's uh, you know known break times, automatic, automatically tag those. If you can pull some information from PLCs, then maybe you could do that. Uh, and microstops, you know, you don't want to be asking operators to tag microstops, particularly if they're trying to stabilize the, the line. So, you know, bringing automation in can also um, increase the, uh, the, the the sort of the, the granularity uh, and human uh, and, and sort of complement the human human context. And then finally, uh, if you've exhausted those and you still have to ask, ask the operator to, to enter some information, then maybe you can think about uh, giving some utility to that function other than just tagging the downtime so it's not just a, a burdensome task. So for example, it, it could be um, if, if the machines run out of material, the, the actual process of tagging that the downtime is waiting for material, maybe that could send out some sort of notification to uh, materials handling to actually do some es escalation. Uh, and maybe more importantly, psychologically for the operator, if that screen turns from red, as, as Bob described, to say orange, and, and that now indicates to their management that the reason the asset's down is, is not the, the, the fault of the operator, then they get some you know, personal uh, sort of uh, utility out, out of doing the, the tagging as well. So, um, yeah, and if you combine those three concepts together, then you know, I think that's how you, you, you uh, it's what, certainly one of the mechanisms you can use to drive uh, really good frontline engagement. So in, in terms of adoption, Bob, um, what did you find that were the key differences across across plants uh, when you consider um, doing an implementation similar to yours? Oh, you're on mute again, I think. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, no. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, you know, you, you look at the data that we have here, and it's yeah, something that the plants never had. Up on the top is what we look at in, in our Lebanon facility, and those are the units. And at that point in time that we took this data, um, two units were not scheduled, two were scheduled and they were running. Down on the bottom uh, gives the, the plant managers and the supervisors in, in, Lebanon, in uh, Portland, Indiana, the opportunity to look at all their units. They could click on the unit, it's gonna give them an hour by hour, uh, indicator how things are running, as well as there's drop down screens that tell us what the issues are. But as a plant manager, as a production manager, um, you know, I, I can look at that in those roles, or I can look at it from afar and say, okay, we're doing okay uh, within the plant and let the guys do their job. Uh, so it's, it's and we're, we're going through a maturation process. We rolled out the additional units uh, across the board as well as both plants, and we'll be reaching out to our California sites pretty soon. Uh, but it's something that the plants never had, and the guys are embracing it. That's fantastic. And I think, Bob, I, I keep hearing the theme of, you know, it's I, I, with the dashboard, which is fantastic. I think from a management and supervisor level, you have that view. And I think for yourself um, in that leadership role, you can have the visibility of what's happening at both my facilities and you have a third one. And I think that's the unique journey that you're embarking on, on kind of doing that multi-plant digitization journey. The one question that I had for you was really related. I think you mentioned earlier that, you know, we did the two units at the, Lebanon, at the Portland site. You guys were able to see that immediate improvement. How, would, how did that translate in terms of like the work-life balance with the employees? how they're finding the technology on the plant floor? Over a period of time, and there, there was some project, heavy projects that we did, uh, but within six months, we were able to eliminate Saturday production. And we were able to um, get to the point where we actually had some 40 hour work weeks instead of 50 hour work weeks, which the workforce embraced. Uh, you know, there's that fine line between, hey, we want some overtime, uh, we've been living on it for a long time, but we also want some rest. So how do we get ourselves and get away from mandatory over time and then at times have voluntary over time for those that want it? This, this allowed us to do that and prove uh, that if we use the data, that we can then make the investment to take it throughout the platform and, and uh, you know, scatter those lessons learned into other areas and build on the business itself. 
So it was, it was a reduction of time and improvement to the off standard, which meant velocity going to the customer. Uh, and just that whole cash flow model that the sooner that we can take that raw material that we can bring it in to deliver to the customers can improve so many different things throughout the business. Oh, that's fantastic. Because I think I've seen with the digitization, I've been guilty on being on some of those projects, right? It seems you're actioning that information that you're seeing as well, which is fantastic. Yeah, and this next slide actually shows kind of how we could then pictorial, pictorially show it to some of our investors, just the difference between units, um, what a true heat weight time is, and how we, there's all kinds of data that we've been able to accumulate through the process to determine you know, we're having uh, more cycles, which means more pieces and getting more output through on a gas fired furnace. But we had to provide that platform with making sure that the gas fired furnace, first of all, was capable doing to US studies and then rebuilds and then being able to provide the guys on the shop floor based on the size and mass of the billet, how to load the furnace effectively and what's the sequence to put in and take out. Then on the left-hand side would be an induction furnace where you have that continuous flow. But as you can see, there's minor stoppages down there and all those minor stoppages add up to the end of the day. And why do we stop? And what we're learning is there's a lot of little nuisance things that the guys have put up with um, over you know, an extended period of time that becomes frustrating. You know, people will understand that occasionally you're gonna have an event. But those little things that you deal with day in and day out that you know you're going to have to do and nobody's taken addressing it, that, that creates a morale issue. That's frustrating. And there's nothing you know, more tiring than being frustrated when you go home. I'm okay with going home tired. We shouldn't go home exhausted because of the frustration. Yeah, every, everybody sort of can focus on the, the sort of the big downtimes. We, we, we know sort of what caused cause those, but those those smaller sort of micro stops are frustrations that, you know, they're, they're just dealt with in the moment and then moved on, but become a frustration. But what this does is it allows you to sort of contextualize those micro stops, see that, I mean, you're losing 4% production there potentially uh, and sort of highlight the opportunity, but also, um, often, if say they're like a, maybe it's a, a mechanical fault or an electrical fault, um, if that's just pulled in from the PLC, it'll be classed as a maybe an asset reliability issue. But if you can add the human context in, you know, you can you can actually analyze that, okay, if the, the, that time period that the machine was down, you know, 50, 60% of that was actually waiting for something rather than actually a, an asset reliability issue. That's fantastic. And I think tying it back to that collaboration piece, Paul, I have a question for you because I think you're showcasing the platform, the data that you've been able to collect. And I think it ties back to that buy-in. So from an operator engagement, I think when I was a project engineer, going back in time again, the worst part about being on the shelf floor was collecting data that went into a black hole. And you never know how it's being actioned, what's happening, but it's that added work and that you're like, why am I doing this? Can you share with the audience and myself how you've been sharing some of this information collaboratively across um, the teams as well in terms of how, how do we get to action some of the data that's being collected as well. That age old skill set of industrial engineers isn't readily available anymore. And as an organization, um, we don't have a handful of industrial engineers to put out there. So we got to collect data and be creative with it and, and utilize the data. And, and to be perfectly clear, there are many a times that we sat in conference rooms with the, the guys, you know, the team members of the units that we had. Uh, the conversations were not always great. Uh, they, they're, they're challenging on both sides. Uh, but, but that's because there's passion, uh, passion about wanting to do the right thing on both sides and sometimes holding us as management accountable. It's not always the easiest thing to hear where we're dropping the ball. Uh, but it, uh, if, if we drop the ban and can accept that as constructive opportunity to get better, and it, it, oftentimes if you take care of the issue, you take care of the little things, some of the big things aren't as bad and you can work towards it. But you take care of the little things that, that improve that, that culture, that reliability and the mindset, it improves it. 
you know, good morning, hello goes a long way. Uh, but if you, you come in in the morning and you're already angry because you know what you're going to have to deal with, it's going to be a long day. Yeah. So, so how do we create a better atmosphere to, to come in and be able to do our jobs? It's not perfect. It is not perfect. Uh, but how do we get a little bit better every day? And sometimes we take steps backwards, but that isn't because we didn't try. That's a great analogy. And then Paul, any experiences to share from your perspective as well in terms of some of the challenges you've seen across just getting that engagement, sharing the data? Um, I, I agree with Bob that um, uh, there's nothing more frustrating for, for, for an operator to be tagging downtime reasons for them for it just to get shoved on a shelf somewhere on a piece of paper and you know filed away. Um, and, 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 and so that's why when you, you, you sort of look at systems that are like that, the, the granularity is just not there. The data is just not accurate. If, if you've only got 50% of the data collected because the operators aren't engaging with it because they, they don't feel as though, you know, first of all, it's a burden on them to fill it out. And if they don't feel there's, there's anything happening because of that, then, you know, they're not going to fill it out every time. And, and you've got those big gaps and those big gaps hide the root causes of the real problems so yeah I've, I've definitely seen that and you know this is one way of um, shining a light and creating visibility and, and and completing that 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 data so that you can make informed decisions yeah that's fantastic so i think we'll continue the conversation because i think um, bob our audience and myself included we're really focused on that result or data perspective so one of the things I loved about the last slide that you share is while you're showcasing the data that the operator is seeing and you mentioned you're sharing that with their investors as well. So I think there's such a strong element around building that trust and using the same song sheet and that pulse, right, of sharing that information across all the different levels of stakeholders within the plan. So again, can you go into more detail again? based on our audience here, would love to hear more of those um, tangible results that you've been able, I know you mentioned earlier, you were able to reduce the Saturday shift. Are there any other big wins that you can highlight since <coughs> your digitization across the plan? Well, one of the first things is to, um, you know, we created a process uh, that then we had to, to sell to our investors and our leadership group that we're gonna utilize the tool to get better. And there was a pattern of time that we needed to prove that the data is relevant. We're tracking the data. We're following the data on a real-time basis. And we're act, making actions associated with it. And then ultimately, what is the, the effects of it? Um, the effects became, you know, greater revenue generation, greater profitability. And, you know, it, we were able to, you know, share some of that with our employees this year. Uh, but it, it's creating those actions and following what are the key KPIs that people impact and breaking it down to simplistic forms. You know, you, you can't be that guy in the shop floor. You want to, they want to come and do their job, but they want to be involved and they want to be successful. Let's not uh, overcomplicate the process with KPIs that are really hard to understand. Uh, they understand pieces per hour. They understand tons. They understand die sets and times that it's supposed to take me to get die sets. OEE and OA is a product of that. But man, there's a lot of things that go into that. So let, let's, let's let those metrics happen, but let's focus on what I can do every day. And if, if I can't run at rate, why? Why can't I run at rate? And I, we, we've had instances where uh, it's come back and said, well, you know, we can't make those rates. And, you know, it was, it was quoted wrong or was engineered wrong. And let's change the standard. And I, I'm not one for changing standards because I got the history. So let's improve upon it. If, if that historically tough job runs at 70% of standard, okay, what can we do to get it to 72? That's continuous improvement and not let it get below that historical average, but slowly but surely make it better that's improvement, that's continuous improvement that's gonna result in better results for the business, which allows us to, you know, hey, maybe we, we paint the bathrooms, maybe we bought a break area for the guys. You know, it was, it was a standalone break area that we brought in, put it next to the shop, it's air conditions, it's heated, we put picnic tables in it. You know, 
shoot, um, we, they even got a Christmas tree and put it out there this year because it, they own it and they keep it clean. Why? Because they, they, are, they earned it, they wanted it, and they, they provided a platform to go out there and get it. So it, little things that add up to big things. And that's such a key element of this tying that back, right? <clears throat> I'm really enjoying Paul. I'm curious to hear your thoughts here. Yeah, it's hard to believe that, but a, a bunch of you know 50 plus year old blacksmiths that love their motorcycles and things like that embraced the small Christmas tree. It was, it was cool, but that that's culture. That's you know changing things for the better, and you know little things. Yeah, and I, I think that people first approach is key and getting into the head of the operators uh, you know I wholeheartedly agree that operators should be given the KPIs that are meaningful to them you know OE is a it's a management metric really you know give, give the operators the things that they feel that they've got the levers to, to influence uh, and then provide them with good quality data to, to help drive that. Well, Paul, there's a mentality that we have that there's only three things the guys on the shop floor can do every day as a choice. Can I work safe? Yeah. Can I make good quality products? Those are both process. The processes need to be up or do that. And the third thing is, do I want to come to work? If, 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 our, if, if those three the questions, are, the answer to those three is yes, I can work safe, I can make good quality work products, and I can come to work, then we have the ability to control delivery. We have the ability to impact our costs, but without a safe work environment, which quality we can make with acceptable quality and people don't come to work, we're never gonna be successful, never. So, you know, we, we gotta provide that platform and, and, and help that along. You can, in today's day and age, you can't push stuff through. You can't, but you can help it. The days of pushing product out the door, push it, push it, push it. Now, today's day and age, people don't want to be pushed. They want to be helped. And this is the, the Raven tool allows us to help them. And that's, I think that's the theme um, that I'm really hearing, which is something unique that I don't always see across all platforms, Bob, because you're really creating that element of a feedback loop of the data is being collected, it's being shared, but we're also incorporating the people element and the process element and I really really appreciate um, the aspect of keep it simple right make the right speak the same language that the operator can understand and set tangible goals I think one of the issues or challenges is always setting that stretch goal where in, in mentally it's like it's impossible for someone to achieve that right but I like if you're at 70 what can we do to get to 72 that's <laughs> continuous improvement to your point you know, there's not a lot of home runs in manufacturing today. There's not. <laughs> yeah. there, there's a lot of little things, base hits. That, it all goes back to baseball. There's a lot of little things that add up at the end of the year. And if, if you take those little things at the end of the year and you look at where you've been as an organization and you look back and you put those little accomplishments together, if you track it right, it allows for better communication. It allows for you know, that, that, that culture of, we, yes, we can. Yes, we can. It's the old Henry Ford adage, right? The, the yeah. quote, I think I can, I think I can't. Either way, I'm right. Well, we're going to transition into our fourth theme, and I think we're already getting into um, a lot of that advice already from the discussion. And I think now we're going to move on to how to execute a digital transformation strategy across multiple plans. I think one of the things that have really intrigued me in this journey as we've talked about Bob was the ability, you're doing it across three plants as you mentioned, and it's the collaboration across all your stakeholders is there. That's a tough challenge to enable. So could you share with the audience as well, just around that journey, how did you get that engagement across all sides to move along with the same platform? I've seen issues just getting people to align to this is the one tool that we want to use right to be able to deliver the same um, deliverable so curious to hear kind of what you can share with the audience on how you've been able to successfully embark on this journey the old process that we had forced the operators to go to the computer log in and go through many steps to input data while they were doing that though they were not allowed they couldn't 
get the equipment running. And oftentimes the, the focus was on getting the equipment running and not logging it in. So you lost it. You lost that data. Um, what the Raven tool allowed it to be very simple. It's a touch of a finger and there might be one drop down or something like that, that I got to do, but it's really simple. And uh, we have to make it simple on it. So that transformation of, you know, the data that was not accurate, the data that was not accurate couldn't be impacted upon. We couldn't react to it because it wasn't accurate and oftentimes became argumentative amongst groups. Uh, this, this data is right. And as a supervisor, if something is input incorrectly, it's a very quick fix to change it and make it right. Uh, so it's simplicity uh, that allowed for that transformation and the fact that it's standalone and didn't have to tie into something else in, in existing infrastructure or servers made it, you know, the installation happened over a weekend. You know, the router was put in to give us greater Wi-Fi and there was a link to be able to, to call it up and, and see it. It, it. it was really simple, just like going to the Apple store and buying the, the app. It, it, and, you know, we'd have, you know, it's a part of the process, but it was that simple. And, you know, that, that's where with what's cool because we may not have the most technically advanced workforce, right? But they all got smartphones. They yeah. all can go out and go to the grocery store and check out in the, in the automated lanes. They all can go to the gas station, put their credit card and push the buttons. That's as simple as Raven is. That's the beauty of it. That's a great advice. And I think Paul, you've equally had that experience of leading the transformational projects across multiple plants as well. What advice would you give our audience today on how to back that or be successful at it? Yeah, well, we've talked about the importance of frontline engagement uh, and simplicity. Um, but when we're talking at the sort of broader industry four level and sort of um, digital transformation across multiple plants, I think one of the biggest challenges from my perspective is how you balance uh, the flexibility that you need to meet an individual plant's needs with the standardization and repeatability that's required for scale. Okay, now these are two opposing forces. Um, solutions that are too flexible, uh, they suffer scope creep and they become so customized to an individual plant that they're, they're no longer transferable to other plants without a whole host of you know, massive additional customization. Uh, and then on the other side of the scale, solutions that are too heavily standardized can fail to meet an individual plant's needs uh, and therefore fail to create that necessary engagement to drive success. You know, every plant's different, even within the same organization, the one size does not fit all. So I personally think that the solution to this conundrum is what we call the best of breed ecosystem, where instead of individual solution providers trying to do everything and create an end-to-end -end solution that ends up pleasing no one particularly well, um, we have an ecosystem of partners all playing to their strengths and, and tailoring a solution to an individual plant or enterprise need. So, for example, at, at Raven, um, we provide a fairly standardized core offering, as Bob's described, um, but through APIs, data connectors, integrations, we can then make all that data available to the wider ecosystem to facilitate customizations. So, uh, this might be as simple as uh, pulling Raven data into an existing digital performance management dashboard or making the data available to higher analytics tools. And I think this sort of balance between flexibility and standardization for scale, mm -hmm. that's going to be critical for, for, for any digital transformation initiative once, once you get sort of that higher level of maturity. Yeah, thank you both for sharing your perspectives. I'm just watching the time here. So I think we're gonna move into our Q&A section, but before we do that, we'll leave up a poll for anyone who's interested in learning more about Raven and getting our demo of our software. So if you're interested in getting a one-on-one -on -one demo of the Raven platform, just pick yes. And all that information will lead you to our marketing teams and someone on the team will reach out.
Okay, so just looking at the Q&A, there was a question that came in, and I'll keep it open, Paul or Bob, if you want to take this on. This was related to our theme on engagement of the shop floor of folks, and it's, the question is, why is it important to capture hourly data at the shop floor level? You want to take that, Paul? Yeah, I, I can take a stab at it. So uh, I, I don't want to misinterpret the question, though. Um, so um, so why is it important to capture hourly data on the shop floor? Well, just, just to clarify, what we've been talking about with Raven, it, it's more event-based. Um, so, you know, it can cope with micro stops that are just machines down for just, you know, a few seconds, even you know, a few minutes. Um, it, it's not necessarily aggregated over an hour. Um, however, if the question's talking about you know, process data and, and sort of collecting that hourly, um, or whether it's about providing sort of the hourly updates to operations around the performance, and you know, th th this is all about, I, I think, granularity and context. And we at Raven believe that the more context you can give, useful context to the data, the better. And and you know the that the granularity is certainly one hour is better than two hours, three hours. But then again, um, getting more granular than one hour is 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 is, is even more valuable. So um, I'm, I'm not sure if I've answered the question there, but um, uh, or if that was the spirit of the question. But but that, that's my current thinking. Just looking at it. Any any thoughts, Paul? Yeah, in our business, so much is you know, based on hour by hour. What are you running? Uh, jobs are quoted. How many pieces or how many jobs can you do per hour? In the automotive industry, it's how many units you get off of FAI every hour and understanding where the slow points are. So it's we have to look at it that way uh, with the way we run the business. Yeah, yeah and I think... In my simple mind always goes back, you're not going to file your taxes without all your receipts, right? You need all the information to kind of move ahead with it. Fantastic. There's another question that just came in, which says, can I see performance reports from my phone? So I can take a stab at that one. Absolutely. I think that's the beauty about it. Like Bob mentioned, if you have your phone, your smartwatch, you could totally um, see all that information as well. So it's very easy to use. The next question um, that we had, and this is directly for Bob, what were the biggest challenges Portland Forge encountered in the human element of integrating the Raven system and how did you overcome them? That question came from David. The biggest challenge is probably management realizing that um, the guys on the shop floor knew what was going on. And when I say management, I mean, mainly the technical guys, uh, when you get into the engineering base and things like that, and understanding the power of engineering providing the process that manufacturer then follows and then quality has to audit too. And if, if engineering doesn't provide the process, which is the complete process, and, and it's, it's like making chocolate chip cookies. Every time you make it, you do read the, the recipe on the back of the chocolate chip thing. You know it off the top of it, but you check, and that's part of it. And from a manufacturing stance, we need to, to understand the process and that integration of people doing it. We had in our project, um, the dynamic was we had design engineers and not a lot of manufacturing engineers. The key person to the project, our initial project was a design engineer that uh, became involved in the manufacturing engineering portion of it. And he, he, he did a, an outstanding job of getting involved and, and creating things. Not always right. Not always doing the right thing together to, to share, show it to the team. But at the end of the day, the relationship that that gentleman was able to, to foster with the guys on the work for, you know, as we do a lessons learned, he goes, today, because of that, I'm a better design engineer because I understand better the manufacturing feasibility and the guys that have been doing it for decades taught me different ways to yeah. do it and make it better for them, which made it better for me. So it, it, it's knocking down that paradigm that is oftentimes between the, you know, the, the, the plant office, the staff, and the guys on the shop floor. We need to knock the paradigm that we all have roles and responsibilities within the company. If we all do our job. 
we're going to be more successful. You know, Bill Belichick calls it the Patriot way. The right guard's got to do what the right guard's got to do his job before he peel, peels off and gets the secondary block. Otherwise, the quarterback's going to get hit. Yep. Do your job. So it, it, it was the biggest difficulty was knocking down that paradigm. And then once we started to knock that paradigm down and we saw some success. And then you start taking care of some of the, the bigger successes. Then there is there's not a lot of hockey sticks in the, the trend charts, but you start to see the elevation happen faster. Mm-hmm. And at the end of the year, you look back and say, wow, what can we do? And we had people, you know, when we first started collecting the data, you know, very soon you, you had other people saying, hey, how come we can't get that in our area? Because they were seeing that there were, there were resources <laughs> being put into that area to take care of employee items. And then you get to, hey, what about me? And now we've been able to cascade it throughout the platform and you know, how, how do we focus on the critical portions of the, of the business that we really need to impact to be successful? So long, long answer, but hopefully uh, an answer that people can understand. No, thank you. And then Paul, I'm gonna hand this one that came from Chris. What KPI or KPIs best measure digital progress and is there any industry market? So, um, I mean, there, there are maturity scales that are out there, sort of level zero maturity, which basically have nothing right up to lighthouse type maturity at, at level five. Uh, and then you can have checklists to sort of check off where you are. I, I think, you know, the, 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 um, the challenge of that approach is that it's all about the tech and the tech maturity. Uh, and as we said earlier, um, you know, you can spend a lot of money uh on a lot of infrastructure for industry four and then start scratching your head about where the roi is because you you haven't considered the case studies uh the the use cases um we've talked about the ground up approach and and for the ground up approach clearly roi for each individual phase is is critical uh and and monitoring that and and having that roi feed into sort of the, the the maturity plan but i think what manufacturers challenges manufacturers have faced with that approach, if it's all bottoms up, is the pilot purgatory approach, you know, and, and the manufacturers have, have, have struggled on many occasions to get past that pilot phase because they can't actually calculate the ROI uh, for, for a given use case. And I think a lot of that comes down to the quality of the data. Um, it doesn't matter how good the analysis is, if the data is not good quality, then you're not going to see a, a real tangible ROI. And so getting that, that, that sort of quality of data. And so, uh, you know, from a Raven perspective, the sort of things that we would look at are, you know, the, obviously the tagging rate, the operator engagement rate, um, and how much of that tagging is automated. You know, there's a whole host of things that we could look at for metrics from the contextualization side. But ultimately, it's the quality of the data that is matters most, and then how that relates to to ROI. And if you can nail that, then your your maturity will correlate with your your ROI. Okay, I'm going to, I'm looking at the time again, so I want to squeeze one last question for Bob here. And the question was: Were workflows or processes improved after using Raven technology? Or say that again. Were workflows or processes improved after using Raven's technology? Yeah, we were able to reduce the uh, time that it took for material to be received, meaning steel bar to delivery to the customer. We reduced that lead time uh, through better process flow uh, within the shop. No, fantastic. I think we've covered all our questions. I really sincerely thank you, Bob and Paul, for your time this afternoon and for our audience for joining us today. There is information there if any of the audience members do want to get in touch with any one of our team members here at Raven. And thank you so much for spending the hour with us this afternoon. Have a great afternoon, everyone.